This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have got a very fun sports day for a Tuesday, which is a little bit odd because we have the American League Divisional Series game number three, both those series coming up tonight, but also it's opening night in the NHL. So here to break things down is Tom Vecchio. Tom's going to talk to us about the three games slated across the NHL for tonight and also talk some futures before the season get on, gets underway. And then I'll talk NFL week number six and where my model shows value Later on, this is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, joined here, as I mentioned, by Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at Tom underscore Vecchio one. Of course, you know him from primetime. Tom here on covering the spread, but also he's an editor for us over at FanDuel Research. Tom, I'm out of breath because I ran the intro. Realized my dog was chewing on something and had to go take it out of her mouth. And the intro is like 24 seconds long. So I had to sprint, take it out of her mouth, sprint back and got back, but didn't have time to catch my breath before actually going through the intro. So I'm going to let you talk for a second. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Yeah, I saw you like hop off camera there for a second. <laughs> I forgot you can see me now. Yeah, because you have the StreamYard capabilities. You probably just saw me like sprint away and then sprint back. And you're like, oh, what's yeah. this guy? The, the countdown started and then you disappeared off screen. I thought I was going to have to solo host for a second, but I'm doing great. Uh, NHL season starts today. Uh, obviously very long season, six months of regular season. Uh, I have a, I would say a couple strong takes when it comes to the season long awards and then a couple team futures as well. Okay. And the futures are something I need to talk to you about because I'm excited uh, based on how things went for MLB this season. We'll talk to you about futures in the NHL and then your thoughts on tonight. And again, as mentioned, NFL week six coming up later on as well. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We're now up to seven shows weekly because we, of course, have Tom here to preview Thursday and Sunday night football games with primetime. Tom, those go up Wednesday afternoon and then Saturday morning morning as well all right here in the covering the spread podcast feed along with FanDuel TV plus if you want to get FanDuel TV plus go to FanDuel.com slash watch and log in with your FanDuel account or go to uh, download FanDuel TV plus on Amazon Fire Apple TV or Roku devices now Tom I mentioned before that I had to pick your brain on the futures market because we had you on before the NFL MLB season. And you mentioned Matt Olson to lead the league in home runs. And Matt Olson led the league in home runs by about 50 because uh, he went over 54 this year. It was a fun sweat. Uh, so kudos to you for that. But that also means you are now legally obligated to tell us your favorite futures in the NHL as well, because you set the, the foundation for me having high expectations for you. So you messed up, honestly. Yeah, Matt Olson, 28 to 1 to lead the league. Uh, certainly a great bet. Waited six months to cash it. But as for NHL, there's uh, a lot of different award markets in terms of MVP. Uh, there's uh, an, uh, the award called the Rocket Richard, which is to lead the league in goals. And there's also Rookie of the Year. And that's where my three uh, main exposures are thus far. So starting off with the Hart Trophy. Uh, I like Jack Hughes at 17 to one and really no matter what, what market you look at in the NHL, at least for players, Connor McDavid's going to be leading the way. He's the favorite for the heart. He's going to be the favorite for uh, the Ross trophy for the most points in the league. Once that gets going, all of these things, he is number one. He's also number one for the rocket Richard, but he's not necessarily a lock. We did see Austin Matthews win the heart a couple seasons ago. And, you know, we want to look at, what Jack Hughes is capable of, which is basically anything. And he's, I think personally, I think he's going to be the best American born hockey player ever right now. It's Austin Matthews at who is currently the best American born hockey player, but Hughes is ready to take that next step. And he showed that last year with 99 total points, which was 12th in the league. Now McDavid had 153 points last year, which led the league, which was 25 more than second place. So what Hughes has to do is be close enough in points to McDavid that we have to then look at some of the underlying metrics, which is certainly a possibility for Hughes. And then when we also align this with the Devils, they're 10 to 1 to win the Cup, and that's third or, or fourth, wherever you may be looking. So they're in the mix to 
win the cup and they have a player that's kind of on the cusp of being a league MVP. So if we kind of align those markets, it's not like we're taking a shot on some random player on a team that's like a fringe team. They're expected to be in the mix as one of the final few teams. So I like having exposure to a player that is, I, I want to say he had his breakout season last year, getting to 99 points. I could see him getting to 110 or 115 this year. And that should put him in the mix for the award at the end of the season. Now you mentioned uh, before Connor McDavid, even money to win it this year. <laughs> and that's absurd uh, because obviously hockey is a pretty wild sport. It can be a bit volatile. It's a long season, which does help for sure. But when you look at the even money, do you think that that's appropriate or does it, is it short enough where it opens up value elsewhere for guys like Jack Hughes at 17 to one? The answer is probably yes to both. Like okay. it's appropriate. He's yeah. literally the best. He's like Mahomes to another level. Like he is by far the best at what he does. Okay. And until he's not playing, he's probably going to be the favorite or like a co-favorite along with a few other players. But that doesn't mean like he's a, a lock to win it. As I said, Austin Matthews won it a couple seasons ago. And it does present value for players that are nearly as good, but will they have the exact same stats, which is kind of the, the argument I'm going to make for one of the other awards coming up. Okay. So Jack Hughes, 17 to one to win the heart trophy, the first future Tom likes, which other ones are on your mind right now? So the Calder trophy, which is the award for rookie of the year. And this is the argument I, I just said, where, how do we evaluate stats where Connor Bedard is the favorite. Connor Bedard is the number one pick. He has been, he was planned to be the number one pick for multiple years. He has been the top prospect for literally dating back, I think since 2018, when he got something what's called exceptional status to play in, in Canadian juniors early. Uh, he broke every possible record. He was the number one pick. He's like Victor Wembayana in the, in the NBA. Like he is that level of prospect. He is the favorite to win Calder. Now, I like Devon Levi at 20 to one to win the award. He is the goalie for the Buffalo Sabres. Now, the Buffalo Sabres missed the playoffs last year by one point, and the Buffalo Sabres are probably one of the most fun teams in the league because they scored the third most goals last year, and they also allowed the seventh most goals. So they are, like, number one on the fun meter because they have an yeah. awesome offense, and their goaltending was terrible last year. Now, Levi made a few starts at the end of the season. So my argument for Levi to win rookie of the year is if the Sabres make the playoffs – it's going to be because of an improvement on goalie and defense partly. And how do we outweigh that or compare that to Bedard, who could probably have a really good offensive season? And I'm not going to lay that with Bedard to win the Calder. I'd rather take 20 to 1 on a player that is fundamentally going to make an impact if the Sabres are going to have success. So when I said like comparing players, it's like if Bedard puts up 70 points, I think his season uh, point total is 68 and a half or 69 and a half. Like if he hits the over on that, that's great. But if the Blackhawks don't make the playoffs, sure. which they're probably not going to, how do we evaluate over a rookie goalie who literally is the driving cause of them making the playoffs? Because we already know their offense is amazing. And I like that where you can kind of make an assumption. You can, if you make the assumption that Buffalo is improved this year, who benefits? And I like that that kind of is a way you can identify value, identify players who may, may be undervalued in certain markets. So Levi, 20 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook to win the Calder. Uh, should I be trying to get out to a, a Blackhawks game this year to watch Bedard? Is that uh, is that like a, an edict from you? Yeah. If, okay. if you could see him, he is, he's the next Connor McDavid. Okay, cool. Well, I've got that on my my shopping list now to to find my way down there to see. There have been, I think I've been to one professional hockey game. Went to a wild game like way back in the day, but it's been it's been a hot minute. So I'll I'll do that as well. Okay, so that's two of them. Uh, looking at Levi twenty to one and Hughes at seventeen to one uh, to win the heart. Which other awards are you liking for this year, Tom? The next one would be the Rocket Richard to lead the league in goals. And as I said, it's going to be McDavid as the number one. But the argument I want to make is not just about, you know, McDavid. If we look at the odds here, McDavid at, at plus 200, Matthews at plus 300, and McDavid's teammate, Leon Dreisaitl, at plus 400. The argument I'm making is they're essentially tied, right? Mm -hmm. They're essentially tied up the top. That's tier one. The second tier would be David Pasternak at 10 to one and Miko Rantanen at 15 to one. That's tier two. I'm going I'm to say those players are tied again, partly for my argument. Then we have Jack Hughes, and then we have Kirill Kaprizov. And for my money, Kirill Kaprizov is the next Alexander Ovechkin. He is the best or one of the best pure goal scorers. 
So while he seems further down the list at 30 to one, in reality, at least part of the argument that I'm making, he's actually tied for third if we're looking at this from a, a general perspective. So 30 to one seems so far off McDavid and Matthews and Dreisaitl, but in reality, we're getting a player at who's third. And he has the potential to get it done. He has that 40, 50 goal type of upside. But I'm taking this based on an odds perspective where I think the number is way too high because we have these such heavy favorites. It's like it's the argument with um, coming into the season for NFL where Mahomes, Burrow, and Allen were all tied at like plus 600 or plus 700, whatever it was for, for NFL MVP, when really you could move two or three players away and all of a sudden you're at like 18 to 1. Mm. So that's the argument that I'm making is that Kaprizov literally has the skill to get it done. And his number just doesn't reflect that because of the heavy favorites. And it, kind of what you're you're looking at there is the number of hurdles he has to overcome is small. Like that's right. effectively your argument, but, right? But the 30 to 1 seems like it's massive when in reality it's not. Right. So if we if we do view like the raw number of players, there are five guys with shorter odds than him, um, ignoring Hughes, who has the same odds. But like. Right. If injuries happen, stuff like that. Guys have rough years as well. So again, I think it's kind of like you do have to view this from a perspective of in any market where it's an upside market. You have to make sure they have the upside to beat the number of people who are ahead of them. And for him, there actually just aren't that many ahead of him that he has to like overcome. Right. And if he gets off to a hot start, you know, he has a a year which you could see which you could say he runs on the hot side of variance where his shooting percentage is above league average, above yeah. his career average. All of a sudden that number in the live markets could drop to 10 to one. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And that opens up options for you to, you know, dig into some hedging options there later on as well. Okay. So any other futures you like before we uh, settle in, talk about this Tuesday slate, Tom? Yeah. So I have all those locked in the, the two that I will say, I have a devil's cup future at 10 to one. Um, you know, just so much makes sense for them where they were, they looked good last year. They kind of took some steps and they lost in the playoffs, which I'm going to say isn't a problem because they were a young team and they like need to go through that process of, yeah. you, you make a step and then you, you stumble and then you have to learn from that and move on. And this is kind of their year to like take that next step to actually be in, you know, the final consideration, which is as the odds would reflect. So I have a, a devil's cup future at 10 to one. Uh, last week or whenever it was when the when it was announced that uh, the Lightning goalie Andre Vasilevsky is going to miss eight to ten weeks with lower back surgery, I immediately locked in a uh, Lightning to miss the playoffs, Lightning under ninety six and a half points, and Vasilevsky under thirty four and a half wins. Now those markets have all shifted. I got them in before sure. they moved, so I'm still on board with the Lightning to miss the playoffs and the Lightning under ninety six and a half points. I believe it's at ninety three and a half points right now. And even if they get to that mark where they're sitting at 93 points, you can just bet on them to win once we get to the end of the March and you can hedge out to come out net even. Right. And that's a long time period to not right. have a very important piece. The Lightning to miss the playoffs is plus 138. Do you still think that's a value there or is the value dried up? I think that's good. I have them at plus 150, so it's really not that far off. Okay. And the... I want to say the division that they're in when it comes to the Atlantic got much better. And if we're expecting me personally, the Sabres to make the playoffs, mm -hmm. that means someone needs to drop out. Right. And the Senators also a team that a lot of people have their eyes on. So if these two teams are going to be trending upwards, the Lightning are great, but they're just a year old. They're a little bit slower. Now they're missing arguably the best, or not arguably the best goaltender in the world yeah. for 10 weeks to start the season. Right. And that's a rough hole to dig out of, uh, especially if it's a very competitive division as well. OK, let's shift our focus now and talk about these Tuesday night NHL games. Three games across tonight to open up the 2023-2024 season. So, Tom, let's start things off with the traditional markets. Where are you seeing value there for Tuesday night? Uh, that would be starting off with Tampa in that first game under six and a half for total goals minus 115. I, I believe Tampa they're going to have to take some type of shifted mentality early in the season. They're obviously a great veteran team, great coach with John Cooper. They're going to have to like take an onus to play better defense because Jonas Johansson, who should be their starting goaltender, isn't that good. So it's going to have to be this team effort to be a little more conscious on defense because they know that Vasilevsky isn't there to bail them out. And then realistically on the other side, UC Soros for the Predators, he's legitimately one of the best goalies in the league. He's up there to win the Vesna, which is the goalie of the year. It's uh, Ilya Sorokin, 
Igor Shesterkin, it was Vasilevsky, UC Soros and Connor Helubuck as the favorites to win the Vesna, and Soros is unbelievable in net. So not to mention the fact that the Predators aren't a good offense. They're like a, a very good defensive goaltending team. And then we have on the other side where I think the Lightning have to make this conscious effort to play better defense. So, and it's the first game of the season. Like, are they going to come out firing on all cylinders? Probably not. So under six and a half, super exciting to start the year. We'll hear a lot of narratives in the NFL about how like, oh, early in the season, defense wins out or early in the season, NFL or offense wins out. Is there a way that tends to go in the NHL or is it pretty much status quo relative to what it's after the rest of the year? We, I think we go through like peaks and valleys where the, the beginning of the year will start off slow and then we're going to have this offensive explosion. And then when it comes down to where teams are fighting for literally every Crack point, down. that's when the defense kicks okay. in because if they, it's like, oh, if we just secure the one point and get to overtime, that's so, so important. So right. I, I think we're going to go through like this lull and then a really big peak. I think we're going to have one of the best offensive years that we've probably ever seen. And then it'll tighten up in, in March. Okay. So under six and a half for the Lightning and Predators is minus 115 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Which other traditional markets are you eyeing tonight, Tom? Uh, the other one would be the Pittsburgh Penguins over six and a half, minus 120 going up against Chicago and Connor Bedard. Um, Chicago, they're going to be fun to watch, but they're still not good on defense. And the Pens have made some clear improvements on offense. They brought in Eric Carlson, Eric Carlson who they trade for in the offseason, who won the Norris last year, which is Defender of the Year, strictly because of his offensive capabilities. He's not a good defensive defenseman. That they're going to put up a lot of points this year, and they're going to score. And this is the this is the time to like get the ball rolling because they're going to have arguably the best offensive defenseman in the league with Carlson on that first power play with Sidney Crosby and Eric uh, and Evgeny Malkin. So two kind of suspect defenses and goaltending with a lot of offense on both sides. So you mentioned the Blackhawks being, uh, you know, a fun team. Are they going to be like Sabres-esque in regards to like that kind of like just kind of being an over-friendly team, like a very goal-friendly team, or maybe a lesser, lesser version of that? It's a lesser version because I don't know if their offense is great. It's probably, okay. it's definitely not great. It just depends on how, how much can Bedard do and how much like help can he get because sure. – a lot of the – some of the talk that I've seen is, like, Bedard's amazing, but how many finishers are there around him? Like, doesn't matter how many amazing passes he makes. He's not going to play every minute. And and if the goal scorers can't find the back of the net, doesn't right. matter how beautiful the pass is, right. like, they're going to – he's going to need some help. And, like, right. if those players step up, if he can help elevate them, then they might become a, a mini Sabres type team. Okay, so the total there is six and a half for the Blackhawks and the Penguins. What about player props, Tom? Which of those are you eyeing for Tuesday night? Uh, that would be staying, staying in that same game with the Penguins. Sidney Crosby at four plus shots at plus 112. The exact over-unders weren't there, at least when I saw. And I think this lines up well. One of the notes for, for the Penguins, at least to start the season, is that uh, Jake Gensel, who plays on that top line with Sidney Crosby, isn't confirmed to be playing tonight. He off-season surgery. Whether or not he's good to be going is yet to be seen. And if they have some random forward that they just put up there with Crosby, really just going to be on him to kind of drive the offense on the first line. Brian Rust should be on this other side, who is not like an amazing offensive player. And this kind of goes in line with the over where I'm expecting a good pace to this game. I'm expecting some back and forth action and Crosby leading the way at just over even money, I think is, is a really reasonable bet to start the season. Now Crosby had a healthy year last year, uh, but it's also his age 36 season. Is this situation where because he's kind of up there in age, you want to buy in on him early in the year before the wear and tear starts to set in? Or did he kind of overcome those concerns last year by managing to be healthy the entire season? I think it's it, it's honestly a little bit of both. And I, I frankly think that Crosby is going to have one of the best years that we've probably seen from him in the last five years where they have this core together kind of for like kind of for like a, a one last dance where they bring in Carlson like they they kind of shored up some of their issues besides goaltending and they like, they have to make it work this year. So they went through yeah. some really rough stretches last year, but this is the year for them to get it done. And I do like that idea, which I didn't really consider about getting Crosby slash older players earlier in the year to kind of have that momentum, at least to start. Yeah. Crosby plus plus one twelve, uh, four plus shots does correlate pretty well to the over, as you mentioned. So I do like that uh, from a, a vibes and jiving perspective, which other player props you like for Tuesday, Tom? The last one would be with Vegas. They are at home. They are raising their Stanley Cup banner. And that would be with Jonathan Marshall Show to score a goal at plus 200. 
Marshall Show won the Con Smythe last year in the playoffs after their Stanley Cup victory, which is the award for uh, playoffs MVP. You bet him, right? Yes. Uh, okay, I bet I him to. So. We, yeah. I, I discussed him to like lead the playoffs or whatever, or lead the series in goals. Yeah. And it's kind of just like, I don't want to say like a, a tip of the hat to him, but it's like, it's a vibe thing where it's like he <laughs> ended last year so strong and he's going to start off the year strong again, combined with his role, his shot volume, top six, first power play, and he's plus 200. Seems a little bit too high. And I know the Kraken are actually pretty solid on defense. That's, that's what they showed last year. They didn't make too many changes coming into this season. So it should be relatively the same. But Marsha Show starting off the year strong, picking up right where he left off at plus 200 just seems too good to be true. We got to salute our king, Jonathan yeah. Marsha So, but for coming through last year, you know, uh, we got to salute him. Exactly. So that's I where I'm at. I, I think I, I, the Kraken to win the division at plus 900 is certainly very interesting to me if their defense uh, can hold, but they probably don't have the offense to keep up with the Oilers. So I have a, a small exposure to the Kraken at plus 900. But hopefully they let in the goal tonight first. Yeah. Uh, from March or so. Okay, that's two to one in the Vegas Seattle game. Also, Tom is on Sydney Crosby, four plus shots at plus one twelve. Lightning Penguins, uh oops, the oh. Penguins Blackhawks over six and a half minus one twenty. Lightning Predators under six and a half right. at minus one fifteen. Tom, want to thank you for swinging by for today. Enjoy the NHL action for tonight. We'll talk to you again Thursday as you get us ready for Chiefs and Broncos uh, right. for Thursday night this week. Yep. Thanks for having me. I will see you guys then. All righty. Find Tom on Twitter at Tom underscore Vecchio one. Of course, you can find the primetime Tom episodes right here in the covering the spread podcast feed every Wednesday afternoon and Saturday morning. We'll dive into NFL week number six in just one second. But first, snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, totals, and more. So visit FanDuel.com and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL, must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-877. 770 stop in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia. Call 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-N-Y or text hope and y in New York. Let's shift focus now and talk about the NFL for week number six. I got two money lines and two totals I am eyeing across the NFL for this week. Let's start things off with a team we have been discussing a lot so far this year. That is the Texans money line as they take on the New Orleans Saints. Right now, the Texans money line is plus 106 at FanDuel Sportsbook. And yet again, I am on them. My model has shown value on the Texans money line every single game so far this year. And they're two and three uh, so far, so they've not won uh, three of those five games, but they did cash a plus 320 ticket against the Jags, so it's still been a profitable endeavor. Now, this time, plus 106, not a ton of juice there, but the hope for me is that they are discouraged from running the football by New Orleans rush defense because New Orleans rush defense is very, very good, and the Texans rush offense is hideous, so... Every time they run the football, I die a bit inside because it's not a C.J. Stroud pass attempt, which has been very, very efficient this year. Passing offense ranks fourth in schedule-adjusted passing efficiency according to number fires metrics. They're probably not going to have Tank Dell here. Tank Dell left with a concussion on Sunday, but they played a lot of those games with no Laramie Tunsil and no Titus Howard, and they returned this past week on the offensive line. 
So they lose a pass catcher, but gain two very good tackles. My model makes the Texans one point home favorites here. So we're getting plus money on the money line at plus one Oh six. I'm okay taking that. My model doesn't hate the Saints as much as most people do, so it's not like an anti-Saints thing. I think they're actually okay. Uh, but I do think that the Texans undervalued yet again at plus 108, more than happy to keep on, or plus 106. So I'm okay keeping uh, riding on the Texans here in week number six. The other money line I like for this week is in the Monday night football game between the Cowboys and the Chargers, where right now the Chargers money line is plus 108. And I get for this game, in Los Angeles, Chargers crowd does not show up. Uh, the Cowboys, the best travel team in football. It's going to be a, cra- a Cowboys-heavy crowd for this game. But the market is kind of treating this like a Cowboys home game, um, which is weird. Because for me personally, I don't care as much about the crowd when it comes to trying to handicap home field. I care about travel. And the Cowboys were on the West Coast this past week. I haven't seen if they're staying out there. But regardless... They're not in their home environment. They will have to travel, whether it be having traveled to uh, Santa Clara or now um, traveling back out to the West Coast to face the Chargers. Either way, there's travel involved for the char- the Cowboys, and the Chargers are at home, so no travel, and they're coming off a bye. So my model makes the, ca- the Chargers two-point favorites here. I do have Dallas as a slightly better team in a neutral environment, but... When you combine the lack of travel for the Chargers with the fact they've had a bye week, it does give them the edge here. They'll get Austin Eckler back this week. They've had an extra week to build an offense without Mike Williams. So I'm not like out on the Cowboys based on what we saw Sunday night. Uh, I still think they're a good football team. They've just been in a lot of weird games so far this year. But I do think that the Chargers being all underdogs in this game undersells the context around this game with the Chargers being um, coming off the bye, being at home, stuff like that. And it undersells how close these two teams are when it comes to my power rankings. So I'll take the Chargers money line plus 108. I thought I had officially gotten off the Chargers and was happy to bet against them earlier on this year, but got to go where the market tells you and the market tells me to bet on the Chargers here at plus 108. So what could possibly go wrong in trusting that very annoying team? The two totals I like this week are actually kind of correlated because there's a lot of awful weather for all the outdoor games for this week. There are 10 total outdoor games, and the lowest wind speed right now is projected to 8 miles per hour. That's the London game. Or no, that's the Buffalo game Sunday night. And then the second lowest is the London game. Every other game is at 11 miles per hour or higher, and the average wind speed for all outdoor games is 13 miles per hour. So... Liking a lot of unders for this week, including one in Chicago for the Vikings and the Bears. Current wind projection there is 17 miles per hour. That's the second highest of the week behind just the Cleveland-San Francisco game. I actually like the over in that game, weirdly, but um, I like the under here for Vikings and Bears. Uh, the Bears' backfield is super banged up. Uh, Roshan Johnson left uh, Thursday night. Khalil Herbert sounds like he probably will not play. Maybe it's like a Deontay Foreman game, and he's been inactive for a reason to open this year for the Bears. So their their backfield's banged up. The Vikings aren't great at running the football to begin with, and now likely won't have just or they won't have Justin Jefferson because he's on IR now. So both these offenses are missing pieces that would be key here in a high win game. And obviously, I, I think that these two defenses are bad. You know, that's that kind of goes without saying, but. I think there are a lot of things saying that these two offenses could struggle in this game as well. So the defenses are bad and that does matter, but the offenses may not be well suited to put up a lot of points in a game where the wind is as high as expected to be. So I just think that 46 is too high here under is minus 115. This total has come down. I think it was 47 and a half yesterday. So we've already seen a reaction to the market, to the winds in these games, but I do still think there is value on the under at 46 minus 115 for the Vikings and the Bears. The second under I like is also in a wind game. That is the Bengals and the Seahawks total for that game right now is 46 under is minus 110. And once again, taking the under here, 13 mile per hour wins for this game between the Bengals and the Seahawks. And that hurts scoring expectations here. Bengals offense did show some life on Sunday, which I thought was very encouraging. And they may get T Higgins back for this game, but Seattle's defense has looked much improved against the rush this year from where it was last year. So even the weather, if the weather does force this game to be a bit more run heavy, 
I'm not sure how well Cincinnati will move the football in that context. Seattle's offense has looked very good. Uh, they have benefited from plus matchups. I still think they're good adjusting for that, but they definitely benefited from that. They struggled a lot on late downs so far this year, but I just think that there are a lot of things combining to make me skew towards the under. You know, I put the wind speed at zero in this game. I'd still lean towards the under. So when you add in the win, I think it's a pretty easy bet to go with the under under 46 minus 110 for the Bengals and Seahawks. So. Unders I like are Bengals, Seahawks under 46, Vikings, Bears under 46 at minus 115. And then the two money lines again were the Texans at plus 106 and the Chargers at plus 108. That's all I got here for the week six first look. We'll have more info on the uh, week six slate on Thursday with Dr. Ed Fang. We'll talk about him, talk to him about college football tomorrow as well but before we wrap up for today got to go back through last week's recommendations here on the show starting off with ed you can find him on twitter at the power rank and at the power ed hit both of his bets uh for last week he liked georgia minus 14 and a half against kentucky and georgia lit it up they won that game 51 to 13 easy cover for ed in that game ed also talked about the jags plus five and a half against buffalo he said he liked the futures market for the Jags more than that game specifically, but the Jags won that game outright. So good week for Ed. He'll put, be back with us again tomorrow to talk about college football week number six. Our NFL player prop guest was JJ Zacharyson. Find JJ on Twitter at LateRoundQB and LateRound.com. Two and two week for JJ, but one of the hits was a longer shot touchdown bet. That was Zach Ertz plus 310. Ertz did score, so that was a win uh, at plus 310 there. Other win was Miles Sanders under 40 and a half rushing yards. Sanders finished with 32, so decently easy under there. Others were George Kittle under 30 and a half receiving yards and Jalen Hyatt to score at 8 to 1. Kittle caught just three passes, so maybe the process there is pretty good. Just happened to be that all three were touchdowns, so Kittle did go over there. Hyatt played a lot for the Giants, so that was the thought process of Pass heavy script, high at increased snap rate. Both those things did come true, but Giants offense just struggled. So a uh, good week, profitable week for JJ. Again, find him on Twitter at late round QB. Pretty rough week for me in the NFL. Uh, wound up going one and four, got saved a bit last night by the Raiders and Packers game. Also had a couple of props in there that were uh, helpful. Uh, the Sunday stuff was the Texans money line minus 106, kicked a bunch of field goals when they had good chances. They also benefited from fumble luck, uh, so maybe that game was closer than it actually was in reality. So, I don't know. Somewhere between a bad beat, it just it's just a loss. I think that's what it is uh, with the Texans minus 106, and number also moved against me there. Also like the over 41 and a half, so the field goals there, especially painful. Finished with 40 total points in that game. Need the Texans to convert on the red zone chances this Sunday for that money line. I had uh, the Vikings plus five and a half against the Chiefs. That number moved to three and a half by close on Sunday. And of course, they could not pull through towards the end there. Did have a chance to tie things up, but uh, the lack of a field goal being an option for them definitely did hurt in that one. And then finally, I had Raven Steelers over 38 and a half. And I think there was a defensive score in that game potentially, but still just seven or 27 total points. So Kind of a bummer there. The win was the Raiders money line. I got that at plus 110 Tuesday. They closed around minus 130, minus 140, somewhere in that range. So good movement, good result. As far as the props go, uh, last night I had the under 45 and a half, which hit. Uh, I had Josh Jacobs under 75 and a half rushing yards. He finished with 269. And then Luke Musgrave under 33 and a half receiving yards. He finished with 34. So Missed out on that one uh, by a yard. Missed out on our plus 461 same game parlay by a yard. And we missed out by a leg. Uh, saying it was by a yard is a bit misleading. So it's important to keep in mind when you come close on parlays, don't feel as if you almost hit the bet. Uh, we were we were short a full leg. That's 67%. So always be sure to, to not be like, oh, I just missed that one. I should keep on going back to the well. Keep in mind that like we did miss by a leg. So... No, no partial credit there, uh, but the individual bets of the under and Josh Jacobs under did hit, so salvaging a bit there. On the NASCAR side of things, hit the winner in the Sunday update to the betting guide over at FanDuel.com slash research. That was AJ Allmendinger, 10 to 1. So again, 
I would recommend uh, reading the betting guides on Vandal Research because those have gone well uh, with the post-practice updates. The bets from the show here are Chris Rebell, 16-1, and Austin Dillon, top 10, plus 340. Bell had a very good car, and honestly, I thought was on the right strategy to win that race, but uh, got passed and then had an ill-time caution before he had pitted. That kind of pinned him in the back of the field. So no win there for Bell. Uh, Dillon... He was kind of just okay most of the weekend, but no no cash on the top 10 at plus 340 there. On the Xfinity Series side of things, I had Austin Dillon 10 to 1, Jordan Taylor 13 to 1, and Brett Moffat 80 to 1. Moffat wrecked pretty early. Taylor nowhere near as competitive as I thought he might be. And Hill, just kind of okay. Um, definitely not a 10 to 1 kind of option. Didn't have the best practice either. So Xfinity did not go well. Overall, not the best week by any means, but uh, the dinger bet and the betting guide helped. Uh, the Raider stuff last night helped as well. So helped salvage a less bad week than it could have been uh, is the way I would phrase that. Looking to bounce back in week number six and with Las Vegas coming up on the NASCAR side of things this week as well. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. We are back once again tomorrow talking college football week number seven with Dr. Ed Feng. Big thank you once again to Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at Tom underscore Vecchio one and find him here uh, for the Chiefs and Broncos preview tomorrow for Primetime Tom. If you have any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck with your bets across NHL opening night or across the MLB ALDS series. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.